Good morning. So what do we remember about school? What was our favorite part of school? Anybody? What do you what, what was your favorite part? Band. Band, of course. Band. Yeah, what else? What else did we like about school? Recess. Recess. All right. What else did we like about school? Who liked math? Who were math people? Raise your hand if you like math. Who were uh, his language arts people? Language arts, writing, oh, writing, love writing. Okay, and who are history people? History people. All right. Well, today I have something special for you. I've got a nerdy Methodist history pop quiz. Woo! I thought back to school Sunday, why not, why why aren't we going to do a pop quiz? Let's get into it. Our kids got to get back into this. How many of us have fond memories of our heart dropping when the professor or teacher said, it's time for a pop quiz? And we went, I know nothing, right? I didn't study for this. You couldn't have studied for it. It's a pop quiz. This is our Methodist history pop quiz. I've got some questions. Maybe some of you know them. And maybe none of you have ever heard this because nobody would ever teach you in your right mind anyways. (laughs) But I'm going to change that today. Okay, here we go. So our first question. Who founded Methodism? John Wesley, yeah, John Wesley's the answer. I gave his brother Charles Wesley a little nod, okay? So John and and Charles Wesley, he did all the music. He wrote most of the original hymns in your hymnal, in fact. He wrote like 165 songs. I think about two of them are really good, but the rest, a lot of them made it into the hymnal. Okay, here we go. So we've got, he wrote the lyrics. Yeah, he, he didn't usually write the tunes. He took all of the popular tunes. In fact, even drinking songs from pubs and, and other places. And he was like, that's a great tune. Let's put it to the words of God. And here we go. All right. So uh, that is John and his brother, Charles Wesley. I'm going to give him a nod. But John Wesley's the one who is known. And the reason that it's called Methodism is because they used to have a holiness club and people thought it was funny to make fun of them and call them Methodist. It was the first Methodist slur was the word Methodist, okay? And here we go. We got it still today. So John and Charles Wesley. Now we're going to move on. Now, John Wesley was known for um, practical theology. And those are some fancy words for saying that he never wrote down what he actually believed, okay? What we got from him were things to live by, and all of the theology, all of the things that he believed, we get from letters to him and his buddies. And so it changes over time. We did not uh, get founded because John had these wonderful ideas about how we should be understanding God. That's how a lot of traditions began. John was not one of those people. He was just really good at organizing small groups, and he loved the idea of these three simple rules. Three rules to live by. Does anybody know these three simple rules? No, this is a hard one, I know. Nobody would ever teach you this, but I will today. The first rule is do no harm. The very first rule of Methodism is do no harm. If you are going to be a Christian, John says the first rule is do no harm. The second rule to live by is do good. Everybody say that. Say do good. The first one is do no harm. We first are going to do no harm. And then if we can handle that, then we're going to do some good in the world. And John Wesley was pretty good at this. The reason I believe that the Methodist church exists today is because John Wesley loved people in the city and community of London, and he had free health clinics for people, and he believed in feeding people, and he believed in clothing people, and he was really good at getting a lot and a large organization of small groups to do good in the community in and around London. Second rule, do good. The third rule is stay in love with God. That's what we say today because the official words that John Wesley would say would be to attend to all the ordinances of God. And nobody ever knows what any of those words mean anyways. So we're just going to say stay in love with God. The third rule, not the first rule, 
interestingly. And these are in order, by the way. They're not three rules that you should live by. These are rule one, you start with do no harm. Rule two, then you move to doing good. And the third rule to live by is to stay in love with God. When we're supposed to focus on what it means to be a Christian. These are John Wesley's three simple rules, okay? So how many of us knew that? Nobody. That's okay. All right. You, Don? More or less. You've heard of it. Long time in the memory. The professor was talking and you weren't paying attention and close enough. I get it. I'm with you. Pop quiz. This is what happens. Okay. Now we're going to move to what are the three ways that we receive grace from God? Now, John Wesley is known for this. And um, this is one of his, I will say, theology, his understandings of God that nobody else would have ever come up with. Okay. These are strange ideas for how we receive grace. What does grace mean? What is grace? That, this isn't the question on the quiz. It's just a question. It's just to prepare us for the question coming. So let's try it. What is grace? What is it? One of my grand aunts. One of your grand aunts. Okay. <laughs> my aunt is named Grace. That's what you just said. Okay. What is grace? Grace is a love of God that we receive that we do not deserve. Okay. There's a deserving part in here that we don't deserve. So it's the love of God that we receive from God that we don't earn or deserve, okay? Now, uh, grace is a hard place for Christians to agree upon, okay? On exactly what does it mean? Because if we're going to be Christians or Christ-like, then you kind of have to act like Christ. That's one understanding of it, which is hard for people. And also what's really difficult about this is that this is the love of Christ that we receive, but we don't earn. So on one side, we're supposed to act like Christ, but on the other side, we're supposed to receive the grace of God, but we don't earn it. Do you see where the struggle comes in? Okay, one says you got to do something, and the other one says you don't have to do anything to receive the grace of God. Confusing. But here's where John Wesley stands. The first way that we receive grace is this word called... Provenient grace. Everybody say that with me. Provenient grace. And this means that this is grace that happens before you know or understand or could even possibly learn about God. Okay? People who knew nothing about God are still loved by God. Babies know nothing about God. They don't know how to say the word. They can't understand it. They can't fathom it. And God still loves them. Provenient grace. People, adults who have never heard of God, who don't know anything about Jesus, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love them. God loves people even if they have no idea who God is. Even if they reject the thought of God. It does not matter who or where or what. God loves you. Provenient grace previous grace okay we got that same kind of root word previous before you could possibly know or understand god you are still receiving god's love okay thumbs up if that makes some sense some sense you can always give me a thumbs down if it makes no sense all right i get that too okay number two the second way that we receive grace is called justifying grace everybody say justifying grace <laughs> And this is the grace that most churches believe in, okay? This is the grace that uh, is mostly agreed upon by most churches, okay? Uh, and this is the grace where when we receive Jesus into our hearts as our Lord and Savior, maybe you have heard those words before. Have you heard those words before? I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And when you say those words... This magical thing happens where we are justified in God's presence. Now, this is a really strange word because, again, we don't earn it. We don't deserve it. But we respond, John Wesley's words, we respond to God's love with, the love, with our own love. Okay? So this is like, uh, imagine um, when you fall in love with somebody, right? And 
They loved you for a long time. And finally, you're like, you know what? I love you too. Does that make sense? Okay, they loved you forever. God loved you from the beginning before you even knew them. They loved, God loved you. And this is a response to say, you know what, God? I love you too. Justifying grace. Okay? Making sense? Yes. Okay, all right, good. And the third grace is sanctifying grace, Sanctifi- sanctification, okay? And uh, I always forget this word, all right? If I, pop quizzes, this is the one that I usually fail at. But luckily, I wrote the pop quiz so nobody could catch me. Sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is the time that we spend with one another falling deeper in love. Does that make sense? When we start a relationship, when we start, like, for example, when I started a marriage 11 years ago, I loved my wife, loved her, absolutely, my whole heart filled the whole thing, right? But 11 years later, I can say that I love my wife more now than I did before. Does that make some sense? I have all these experiences. We've grown together. There's a deepening of my love for her. And this is what sanctifying grace is. It is a living with God day by day. It is a growing with God. It is an understanding. It is a changing of who we are every single day to fall a little bit deeper in love with God. Now, this can't be linear, okay? This is not linear. (laughs) Because sometimes we fall out of love with God. Sometimes we fall out of love with God. And then we got to reset and we got to go, you know what, God? I got to learn to love you again. And then we got to restart again. So this isn't like linear, like going on. But John Wesley had this word, this phrase that stuck around, and I don't like it, but I'll teach it to you because this is what he's trying to get to. He said that we're going on to perfection in love. John Wesley believed that we could move, that our bodies, our hearts, our minds could start to be so ingrained in God's love that we would spend so much time that we would get to understand God's love for all people so deeply that we could get more perfect or better. More better is not the right word, but that's what I'm going to say. We're going to get more better. We're going to get closer to loving people perfectly. At my ordination, they asked the question. These are John Wesley's questions for ordination. And they said, are you going on to perfection in love? And we have to say yes to that if we want to be ordained, okay? And in my head, I went, yeah, kind of, right? I don't like the word perfect at all. But I understand what John John is saying. He's saying that there are going to be moments in our life where we are moments where we are going to be able to love people so deeply that it's going to be like perfect love. It's going to be a glimpse or a moment of God's love, which is perfect all the time. A moment of God's love for other people that's perfect all the time. So I thought as I was thinking about back to school, I was thinking about school and I was thinking about this day by day waking up and eating breakfast. I'm in this mode right now, okay? I've got three girls, two and a half of them are in school, okay? And day by day, we wake up early and the alarm wakes us up. In fact, this is the first year that the alarm woke us up and it wasn't the little baby waking us up at like five in the morning, like, come on, come on, come on. But our alarm's waking us up and we wake up and we eat breakfast and we get dressed and we brush our hair and we try to remember where everything is, where are my shoes, and where's my backpack, and where's my my lunch pail, and we try to get all of those things together for all three of our girls, and we try to do that for ourselves, and then we try to get the stuff, and we try to get in the car, and we try to make it to school on time, and we get to school, and my kids have to go into school, and they have to learn, and they get taught something every day, and then when school's over, they've got to prepare their stuff. They've got to bring their things home. They've got to unload everything. They've got to do their homework. We've got to get ready for bed. And the next day they do the same thing again and again and again for 180 days out of the year. 
schools run, and they do it every day. If a child doesn't show up, they still have school. If a teacher doesn't show up, they still have school. If a principal doesn't show up, they still have school. This is an amazing feat, folks, that we have all just been like, yeah, that thing runs no matter what, right? I mean, unless there's some crazy natural disaster, they'll take the day off, and then you know what they'll do? They'll make it up. This is amazing. Like, don't, it could snow in Burbank, and nobody can drive anywhere, and they're like, don't worry. We'll just make it up later. We'll take one from your summer vacation. Like, what is this magical, wonderful, crazy organization that we have that we've all just accepted? It runs all the time, no matter what. There was an earthquake, and my wife had fifth graders screaming and running around the classroom. And you know what they did when it was over? They went back to work. Can you believe that? They were like, yeah, it's just an earthquake that freaked us all out and scared everybody on the first day of school. And they all just went back to it like, yeah, we got to keep going. This is amazing. It wasn't like the earthquake in 71. It wasn't like that earthquake. That's right. But this is an amazing thing that happens. And sometimes I think John Wesley was big into this. He was trying to live a life with God kind of like that. He would wake up early. Now, he would wake up really early because they all went to bed early because there was no TV and no electricity to watch at bedtime, okay? I'm convinced John Wesley would have watched Netflix, but he went to bed early, he woke up early, he studied the Word of God. And then he would do an hour of meditation, and then he would eat breakfast, or sometimes he was fasting, and then he would go and he would start serving people in the community. And then he would gather his group leaders and his organization and there was three different times of small groups, and he had everybody kind of organized in a way, and he would go and do that. He was also an Anglican pastor, so he was also serving in a church. <coughs> John Wesley was committed to this day-by-day -day Christianity and life with God, sanctifying grace. It's like school. It's like being an athlete, where if you want to do something, you've got to put in the work to do it. Are you with me? You've got to put in the, the time in the relationship. It's not just work. It's a relationship with God. So you do things that will help you understand and be with God. In fact, you might say that you live a life that is full of methods of uniting you with God. And then you have people in a group, and they make fun of you, and they go, those people over there are Methodist. They think that they can live a life, they can do something every day, or they can continue to live a life and do things that will be help them understand and live with God. They will have a method to their life that is living closer and closer to being with God. So what does that look like? Well, our scripture today is uh, the scripture, Romans 12, 2, that my seminary used, okay? It was on these big fancy stones. I went to Duke Seminary, so everything was big, fancy, and stoned, okay? That's, what, that's just the place. So it's not anything strange, but it had the words above it, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, Okay? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is what school does, okay? We're, we understand and we are transformed day by day into learning how to read by the transforming, the renewing of our mind. They start with the letter A and they keep teaching you the letter A until you have mastered the letter A. And they'll say it a 100,000 times if they have to. A, ah, 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 okay? And then they move on to B, ba, ba, ba. School has to have figured it out. If you want to teach somebody, then you do it again and again, and you do it over and you do it over, and you learn it in third grade, and you review it in fourth grade, and you learn it again in fourth grade, and you review it in fifth grade. You do it again and again. You are transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
Well, the goal of being a Christian, in my understanding, is to first do no harm. How do we do no harm in this world? This is a tough, tough question. Doing no harm, well, it seems like everywhere we turn, we can do harm. We can do harm without thinking about it. We can do harm to somebody without knowing them. We could do harm to a friend because we do know them. We, everything we do could cause some harm. But here's the kind of lengths that Jesus talks about. Jesus says things like, if your enemies are hungry, you feed them. If they're thirsty, you give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not come, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is something, these words, that you don't learn in other places. We don't learn this in TV. In TV, we love when the good guy finally gets the bad guy. In movies, every action movie, it starts with the bad guy doing something bad. It starts with the good guy doing something good. And then at the end of the movie, the good guy beats the bad guy. Woohoo! We did it. And we all feel good and we feel justified. Yes, that good guy beat the bad guy. And in cartoon movies, the bad guy will die be not because the good guy did something, but because the bad guy did something so evil that they fell out of a window, right? But the bad guy loses and the good guy wins. Where else do you learn in the world that we don't respond to evil with evil? That we respond to evil with providing food for them and clothing. And that we love our enemies as ourselves. The scripture says other things like... Starting when we, that, that's the do no harm. Now, what about doing good? How do we do good? Well, in verse nine, let love be genuine, hate what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Pursue hospitality of strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be arrogant. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble to the sight of all. You see, sometimes I think in the church, we forget just how deep God wants us to love one another. And the hard part about this is that we don't get this message anywhere else in the world. It's not reinforced anywhere. If you want to learn something, if you want to be renewed in mind, body, and spirit, well, then you got to spend time in that space. If you want to learn how to read, you got to spend time in that space of learning how to read the day by day. The time it takes for us to be transformed is not something that happens one off. If I gave you this pop quiz in 10 weeks, you're all going to forget it, and that's okay. Because that's not how we are learned and that's not how we are transformed as people. It takes time and it takes energy and it takes investment in a relationship with God if we want to be Christians who act like Christ. Does that make sense? I was once in piano. I lasted about six months in my piano lessons. (laughs) <laughs> and I loved my piano lessons. I learned the C scale, and I loved my teacher, and I loved going to her house and playing her wonderful, big, beautiful piano. I loved it so much, and I loved the smell of her house, and my brother played piano, so I would get to play for the 30 minutes beforehand, you know, or an hour beforehand. I would just get to play. She had some toys in her, in her house for us to play with. I loved it so much. And week by week, I would go back and I would start to play. 
And my teacher would look at me when I sat down at the piano and I would start to play, and she would say, did you practice this week? And I went, no, that's what piano lessons are for. And she's like, you know, if you want to learn how to play the piano, you have to practice. Like these are lessons. You're going to, you're going to learn these lessons and then you got to go home and you got to practice those lessons so that when you come back next week, I can teach you something new. But an hour a week is just not enough to learn the piano. It'll take you your whole life. You'll never learn the piano if you only give this one hour a week. If we only give God one hour a week, it's hard for us to be renewed and transformed in mind, body, and spirit to be like Christ. It's hard to do no harm. It is hard to do good. And it is hard to stay in love with God. <clears throat> it takes time. It takes intention. It takes prayer. It takes things that we do that matter in our lives so that we can live this kind of life that we proclaim with the word Christian. A lot of people claim that word. How many of us live this kind of life? It's hard. But this is why we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, why we spend the time in prayer, why we spend the time learning about what Christ is like, where we spend the time in small group, where, where we spend the time together in fellowship, where we learn from one another, where we invest in our life with God so that we can live a life that is moving on to perfection in moments, perfection in moments, where we can love one another like God loves us. Welcome back to school. You're invited not to learn this stuff, but to learn what Christ is like, to invest in a relationship with the living God who loves us so much that it can transform our lives. I'm excited to be with you. I'm excited to learn with you every single day and on Sundays too. Let us pray. Lord, let us not conform to this age, but let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can discern your will. We can discern what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let our love be genuine. Let us love one another with mutual affection. Let us be ardent in our spirits. Let us serve the Lord. For, Lord, we rejoice in hope, we are patient in affliction, and we persevere in prayer. Lord, let us love one another, and let us be Christians, Christ-like, and let us love this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.